you know, we think natural movement is an important thing. We think it's a natural thing. We think everyone should be doing it, but maybe not. Maybe you're not ready to do what's natural. Let's find out on today's episode of the Movement Movement, the podcast, for people who want to know the truth about what it takes to, well, have a happy, healthy, strong body, starting with the feet first, because those things are your foundation, where we look at the mythology, the propaganda, sometimes the outright lies about what it takes to run, to walk, to dance, to hike, to do CrossFit or yoga or lift or whatever it is you like to do enjoyably, healthily, efficiently. I am Stephen Sashin uh, from ZeroShoes.com. I'm your host, and you know the drill. We're all about trying to make natural movement the obvious, better, healthy choice, the way natural food currently is. And it is a movement, movement. And because it's a movement, that means you're involved. So if you want to be involved and spread the word, spread the word, <laughs> something you're going to put on a bagel. Some spread, That's right. That's right. Spread the word. Spread the, spread the thing on the bagel and then say That's some right. words. Uh, you know what to do. Come to www.jointhemovementmovement.com where you'll find previous episodes and how and all the ways that you can share and like and review and thumbs up on YouTube and all the things you know how to do. If you want to be part of the tribe, please subscribe. And what else did I want to say about that? Normally, you see me wearing a Zero Shoes t-shirt. Today, because it's freezing cold, I'm wearing my Frozen Dead Guys Day t-shirt. If you get a chance to see the, find the movie, uh, Grandpa's Still in the Tough Shed. It is a hysterical movie about uh, Boulder, Colorado, the area around here, and a um, Norwegian immigrant who started his own do-it-yourself cryogenic business <laughs> in the Tough Shed. Anyway, we're here with Skylar Tanner. Skylar, welcome, welcome. How are you, man? I'm doing great, man. Just living awesome. the dream. Well, you know, people hooked us up and said, uh, if we're talking about natural movement, you are someone I need to talk to. We've had no conversation basically prior to this, which is my favorite way to do it. Let's like jump in. So, um, and I don't ask people for intros so that I can do their intros because that's always boring as crap. So who the hell are you and what are you doing here? So I, I think I, the reason I'm here is because in 2011, we were both at the first Paleo FX conference and you told a great story about the only time you were in a fist fight and how it was the most <laughs> ape-like thing possible, how this guy came at you like, <laughs> like, like yeah. hands up. No, like, no, his hands up. No, it was better. He was lifting his shirt up. It was like, Ugh! oh, that's right. You know, I mean, <laughs> it, it was like it the looked, moment, looked like it was something out of a out of a David Attenborough flick. It was, and, and, the, it was, and the moment he and the moment he, he like hits you and he's like, all right, let's go drink a beer. It was like that. That was it. That was yeah, the yeah. end. Of the, oh, no, crazy. Yeah. No, as he's running towards me, this is a, a, in Atlantic City. I was doing stand up comedy at the time on my way home from from a gig, and it was just like. It just seemed like this weird predestined thing where all I had to do is let him punch me once and get it over with and we'd be done. And that's exactly what happened. It was the strangest thing I've ever experienced. So I don't know if it was called, I don't know if I would call that being in a fight because I didn't do anything. Right. But, uh, I right. was part of a fight, I guess. Part of a fight. I was, uh, <laughs> I was fight adjacent. Um, <laughs> I was fight adjacent. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then you at the time, you, you had just the sandals and yeah. they were the like at home sandals and you oh, had yeah. the beads. You were running all oh, the yeah. beads up and down. And so it was just a great kind of open, almost open conversation we're talking about. I, I, uh, we were, we were thrown together on a panel and it worked really well. But yeah, but we didn't have we didn't have this conversation, and the panel no. discussion about natural movement was really entertaining because at one point I remember saying, kind of, you know, everyone's talking about all the different things about natural movement, and I said, oh, and I remember actually we kind of bonded over this. I said, look, let's you know not mince words or let's call a spade a spade. We can't do what human beings evolved doing. We're not walking down to the river and collecting no. rocks to build a house. We're not walking for no. twenty five miles to get our meal once every other day. Maybe we're not, you know, we're just not doing those activities, and you can't really fake it. It's sort of like as a sprinter, I get out on the track, I run as hard as I can, um, and you know maybe I'm a little sore the next day. But if I'm in a race, I run for 10 to 12 seconds, and I am toast for a week. So there's a whole different sort of bio, biological thing going on when you've got different biology going on the way people did when they were either running to catch food or running away from being food. Right. So you can do all the functional movement you want. It's not the same as doing any of those things. And mm -hmm. uh, that kind of put a crimp in the conversation for a little while, but I remember well, kind of going, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it's, it, and it's true. It, I mean, all of this is, you know, kind of what we were, we, we, what we talked about with, with fun. It's so fun. Cause I mean, I orient my life around these, I mean, these are clues at the end of the day and, and we're trying to do a, a clue based proxy of what we are forced to do in the past just to survive right. on the idea that the things that are killing us now were not prevalent or at least not based on what we, if we triangulate on extant hunter gatherer groups are not prevalent in what we do. So how do they move? How do they behave? What do they eat? And that clue is, is 
it's, it's almost like quoting, you know, chapter and verse for a lot of people. It's like, well, they yeah. did this thing. Yeah. They, they climbed the tree. They did this. And that's what we must do. And, and they only use their left arm. The left, that's right. That's right. We, 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 <laughs> what was the, uh, what's the, the, um, the spear like lever increasing oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. the, um, the, 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 the at, 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 there you go. And so I, well, and if, that, and if that's the case, then we should all ride bulls because if you look at the Cro-Magnon and, and all, the, the brake marks in the skeletons resembles that of rodeo riders. Like if you're trying as a group to bring down a, a, a large herd animal, somebody's getting thrown off and somebody's oh, getting broken weird. real bad. Wait, so you're also then suggesting that some of our, uh, our Neanderthal ancestors were dressed as clowns running around uh, and you know, jumping into barrels. Uh, right, yeah, that's right. They, they, right after they carved the wheel, they carved the barrel. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know. There you go, right there. There's your punchline. After they carved the wheel. So, so, so my background, I'm a clinical exercise physiologist by training. I mean, I'm, I'm a gin owner by trade. I've been in this business for 21 years, and I certainly... You know, if, if you want street cred, like I said, first paleo effects, first ancestral health symposium, which, you know, I don't know how much that, that, that and three fifty will buy me a cup of coffee. So, so, but oh, it's more, you're, you're, you're optimistic. I think I'm optimistic. I, I, think I, I think it would get you the ability to walk into a coffee shop and smell the coffee. I don't know what I'm going to, I'm who there in, in Boulder. They have the boiler maker because of the altitude. It's going to drive me crazy. They can, you're boiling coffee at like 200 degrees there, right? right? It's not, yeah. it's not oh, right, right, right. It's. Oh, it's driving me crazy because it's great. It's all in these halogen bulbs with the yeah. cool flask and they drop in two ice cubes at the end and dump it in your cup. It's driving me crazy, but it's a I'm great- I'm not a coffee drinker, so I don't know it except yeah. that I know of it. Yeah, that's right. It's a, it's a, it's a great visual. Anyway, I have, a, I have a cousin who lives in Boulder, so it's- I'm sorry. <laughs> She's sorry too. For are, are, you, are you able to have a conversation without the, use, without the use of the word chakra? Yes, I am. Actually, that's, there's, a, there's a running- Well, so my other cousin who used to live in- in Boulder and, and could not have the chakra conversation without chakra. Now she's somewhere off the grid in the front range, as you do, as you do. As one does. Yes. As one does. It's just inevitable. I mean, when you move to Boulder, um, you're required by law within 60 days to either get a Subaru or a golden retriever. Uh, Labrador will get you a warning. Um, any sort of doodle now, actually, you get a bonus. You get a bonus, right? <laughs> you can, you can't have the, you can't have the purebred. You yeah, gotta have the mix. Yeah, so, so anyway, but the, the, the point is, is that, so, so coming from this, you know, kind of from the rehab side, but also working with real people side, it, you know, I'm certainly inspired by the videos of people often single in the Pacific Northwest in the wilderness running around and having, you know, just, just having a great time climbing trees, diving the water, pushing, like, it gives me a good feeling to see that. It's like when I'm trail running in the green belt here in Austin, you know, it's, if somebody got a high def 4k camera on me, I, I could sell the same thing. Right. Um, but, but I think what ends up happening is that we, the populace at large is pretty sick. Even those of us interested in natural movement and kind of curious about asking these next questions, where can we go? Can we, you know, I, I see I'm, I'm movement deficient in my life and what's the next step. And I think about this from a foundational perspective of do these people even have enough body awareness, which they'll get with natural movement, just like zero shoots. The whole point is, you know, your feet are, are incredibly sensitive, but they shouldn't be painfully sensitive. They're just that desensitized, right. you know, initially. It's like, I mean, how many people have told you at trade shows, like, I, you know, I like what you're doing, but my feet, I can't walk in. My, my feet hurt well, when I'm walking barefoot. Well, very, not a whole lot, but, but um, uh, the way, when people say to me, I can't walk barefoot, they usually say something like, oh, I have plantar fasciitis. And I say, so uh, first, let me stick my thumb in your calf and see if I can find a spot that if I dig on that, you're, quote, plantar fasciitis goes right. away, which ha happens 90% of the time. Mm -hmm. Then for the other 10%, they say they've been wearing orthotics or insoles and supporting their feet for some extended period of time. So they're not walking barefoot because it's not painful from a sensation level, but it's painful from a, what's called a structural level. Um, and I say, well, that's because, you know, it's sort of like if you've had your arm in a cast for a year and then you take it out of the cast and someone throws a weight at you. I mean, right. that, you know, let your feet move and then and start building up some strength again. Right. But to your point though, I, I vividly remember remember when I first started going barefoot primarily, which is now about 12 years ago, um, it, it did feel like I was just overstimulating my brain. It didn't feel like my feet were get were doing too much. It literally felt like my brain was getting overloaded. And uh, since your brain's primary function is to actually weed out information because there's way more coming in than we have any ability to process, it just felt like that was going on. So I see that with people where at first it's just too much. And then it's not like you're, then people have the mistaken idea that 
what happens over time is their feet get less sensitive. It's just what happens, I think, and you can tell me what your take is. It seems that your brain just gets better at weeding out the information you don't need and just paying attention to the sensational information that you do need. It's useful. Yeah, I, th- I think that it's actually funny because I was the first time I ever ran like a barefoot like five miler. It was because it was raining. I was, I was wearing um, the non padded version of your sandal that has the straps. Uh, the Warache style sandal. Yeah, not the not the Warache. The, uh, oh. the the one that's more like the why am I forgetting? Oh, the like oh, like the Z Trek. Z Trek. It was wearing the a Z Trek yeah, and it was Z-Trek, starting to Z-Trek. rain. It was starting to oh, rain, yeah. so my foot was starting to slip around on the mm-hmm. on the top of the. So I was like. I'm going to hurt myself. So I took them off and ran this five miler, you know, it was like a turkey truck and my feet were fine. Right. Yeah, yeah. You know, because I've been barefoot for all, all of my life. I used to, I said, weirdo used to go to college, like and even in Phoenix barefoot with the moccasins, you know, so that when it got yeah. too hot, I put them on. So I have a long and long history of training barefoot. So right. I have a foundation of loading my feet in an unshod or unsupported way. And what do we do anyway to tell when we tell people moving into barefootedness is either, we're telling them to t- you know do it walking or just right. standing. Right. Often recommending things like you know your you, your your feet might have tight spots that you didn't realize using a little bit of lacrosse ball or tennis ball work. That that like rocky pebble platform that y'all sold for a while and yeah. or that compression kind of balance thing that the deeper muscles of the foot. So there's often this idea of of needing a little bit of prehab just to get us back up to baseline. So yeah, let's pause there because I want to do two things. First, we're already kind of jumping into what I was teasing at the beginning, which is, which is, you know, are people ready for natural, which seems like a crazy thing, Mm -hmm. but it's an interesting thing to investigate. And we can talk about that from, Mm -hmm. uh, I'll I'll mention what Irene, uh, not argument, but an ongoing conversation that I have with Irene Davis about this um, or with, uh, well, anyway, but before we jump there, um, I want to put you on the spot a bit since this is the movement movement podcast and we like to share a movement thing for people to do whether they're if they're in their car maybe they can do it maybe not maybe they have to wait to go home Um, if they're out in public you know hopefully they can do it and be embarrassed and we get video of that whatever you can think of can you think of some movement something thing to share with human beings yeah absolutely so one of the things i talk about when what we do here at smart strength is uh i talk about evidence-based resistance training and and we talk about joint friendly fitness and what do we even mean by that is that yeah what the hell do you mean by that what the hell do i mean by that oh well 90 to 95 percent of surgeries orthopedic surgeries are routine because we don't have to find because we operate the same way my biceps tendon is basically in the same place as your bicep tendon not the same way mine moved not yours is moved (laughs) i'm I'm sorry you're that I, mean, I, I believe it. Yeah. Um, but the point being is that your arm isn't bending backwards with different anatomy. As a right. human being, things are generally the same. And so if you know that, the reason why surgery is going to be about 95% routine is because we know where the pore positions are. We know where the ligaments bind. We know where the tendons rub. We know where the tissues compress or impinge. So one of the things I tell everybody is um, a great example, a visual of this active insufficiency kind of thing going on. This is a classic martial arts joint lock, which is, you know, Brazilian jiu-jitsu takes a full advantage of poor biomechanical positions. Right. What you often see in a gym, though, is that people, because you feel something in these poor biomechanical positions, they do these exercises because feel is a compelling argument. Even okay. if that feeling is just because it's a poor position, not because you're working more. Mm-hmm. So a classic joint lock is the wrist joint lock, right? So the flexor muscles, or the, the grippy muscles right here, yep. they also move your wrist in the flexion. But as long as you're holding a fist, the muscles on the backside, which come around over the top, they are stretched out over the wrist. It's like, yep. a, it's like a giant crane. So the only way you're getting the full anatomical flexion is to open your hand to let it drop all the way down. Oh, interesting. And you can't hold a fully closed fist. That's a classic no. joint lock. If someone's got you, they will try to ra- right, do right, this right. to break, or it's, a, it's a, oftentimes in Krav Maga or self-defense stuff. If somebody comes at you with a knife, they're always trying to do this to open the hand because you can't hold it shut because of the biomechanics of the wrist. And so the second order question you ask then is, knowing these poor joint positions, Can we avoid them if we're trying to load muscle tissue? Or even second to that, if we are training to make ourselves robust, knowing that we're going to get hurt in real life, we can give ourselves injury resistance, can we avoid those positions in our training accepting the risks of the real world? Well, I want to to back up just to do this wrist thing because this is a really interesting thing. It's like, you know, hold your arm. Make a fist. So your forearm's perpendicular. Your forearm's perpendicular. Right. You know, 
straight wrist, make a fist and make a fist as much as you can. flex. Right. Right. Now open your hands and watch how you can bend your hand more. Yep. And try to make a fist there and you can't, you can't and, close the fist. Uh, you know, a whole bunch of tension in the front part of my forearm. Mm -hmm. It's actually more in the front, which is kind of funny because the back is getting more stretched. Yep. That's like a really weird thing. Now mm -hmm. I did Aikido for years and same thing. It's like, you know, you want, what you want to do is put, put joints in positions where they don't want to move and then right. kind of in other positions they want, don't want right. to move. So you're right. immobilizing someone in kind of two dimensions. Um, and uh, I have, actually I have a funny story of being in New York City at a um, concert in Central Park and the things were kind of muddy and we had our blanket down and people were like walking all over our stuff. It's like, look, if you're going to walk over our blanket, take off your shoes. And some big guy just starts walking over our blanket in his muddy shoes. And I just reach up, I'm sitting on the ground and I'm not a very big guy. I just reach up and I grab his wrist in one of these ways that you do this in Aikido and I start turning his hand and his wrist and bringing him slowly down to the ground with yeah. the and thumb and yeah. he was looking at me with this look that was kind of two things like hey i would kill you if i were you were standing up and how are you doing that yes yeah <laughs> and i felt kind of bad about it just like but i was trying to make a point like just take off your damn shoes no big deal yeah uh, but yeah it's it's amazing and especially those those extreme positions like in the, in the hand and the wrist how quickly we respond to being in a bad position by going whoa 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 stop that or how 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 wrong it feels when we're in one of those positions i had um quick uh, pardon me again a quick aside i was we we're taking some photos to promote um the speed force in a catalog and i found this cool bush to jump in front of to get this really cool look um but and the bush was right in front of a sewer drain and i had so i had to run up to jump on the sewer drain uh, or off the sword drain in front of the bush, but I couldn't run in this like parallel or in a straight line because there was all this mud on the side of the road, uh, on the the part on the bush side of the street, like over the curb. So I had to run on the street, jump onto the sword drain, then do this leapy thing. And after 10 times of doing it right, the last time I caught my foot in some weird ass way. And when I kind of rolled onto the ground, um, my foot felt really peculiar like, mm -hmm. is it wet? I mean, am I bleeding or something? And I looked down, I didn't see any blood on my shoe. And it's like, what the hell's going on? And I take off my shoe and my fourth toe doesn't have the pad of the toe on the ground. It's pointing up in the air. It had dislocated and spun around 180 degrees. And yes, that look on your face was on my face. Like, it just was so wrong. And it didn't hurt. It was just like, oh, that is just not supposed to be that way. And I was surprised at how intense the, oh my God, reaction was considering, yeah. you know, there was no pain. And then I just touch it and it snapped back in place. Like, oh yeah, that's probably not good. <laughs> and the pain probably came later. Like, you know, your, your brain's almost going like, I don't know what the hell happened there. Pain, don't touch it. Well, don't no, touch it actually it. never really hurt. Um, wow. I get to the doctor and he said, well, I'm not going to bother taking an x-ray because if you broke it, we'd do the same thing if you just dislocate it, which is just tape it up to the toe next to you. So mm -hmm. just, you know, tape it up, leave it for around for a couple of weeks, you'll be fine. And yep. that's exactly what happened. But, it, but just again, just like the, the, the effect of some of something at the extreme ends of our body just gives us so much information. Uh, but anyway, so, all right, so there's the one movement thing. So yeah. keep going about this whole phenomenon of joints so, in the wrong position. So, so, so when, when I, when I talk to clients about, and, and we'll bring this back to natural movement and, and kind of okay. the point I make here as, as somebody, you know, who likes to, I, 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 um, I love this stuff, but the idea that, that, well, cyanide is natural, Poison ivy is natural. You know, lots of things are natural. And the question is, the question is whether or not they are helpful to us. And, and the, the opposite question or the backwards question is, can something that is semi-constructed help us to live more naturally? I mean, mm, yeah. yeah, obviously. I mean, that, that or at least what we want from the natural living. Like, I don't want to necessarily to, you know, sleep outside all the time. I don't necessarily want to crush things with rocks. I want the benefit, the things that came as a secondary consequence of well, that, the look, natural let's, food, let's face facts. forest you bathing, running around yeah. in a loincloth. <laughs> I you know, only because we're in Austin, man. We're in Austin, <laughs> that, man. It's cool. It's fine. Um, <laughs> You know, I want, I, I, I love my, I love lots of things of modernity. So we want the consequence that the natural movement gives us. And so my, my whole thing, when I'm working with people, I tell them, is like, I want you to go get hurt doing things you value, things you'd rather be doing, but you shouldn't be getting hurt in here. And so I want to support people who are taking the initiative to get themselves healthier, you know, whether it's the, whether it's material I'm putting out or something like this. And that idea that sometimes something a little constructed to help build up your foundation can help quick, more quickly get you to the thing you'd rather be doing 
which is spending more time on your feet without pain and living in the world. So two things. Thing number one, we're, uh, well, I'll, I'll preface thing number two, which is let's talk about uh, things they could do. But yep. first, I, wanted, uh, I want you to give an example of something where people are doing or putting a joint in the wrong position or doing something out of whack that they think is good because they're getting the unpleasant sensations that are giving them the wrong information, et cetera. <laughs> Sure. So every human being on planet Earth is a function of kind of actually the, the way, oh, I wish I could give you this for show notes, I could probably find it. The way in which we, we became throwing creatures, uh, yeah. this winding up of our peck over our shoulder, winding up to snap as a, as a giant rubber band across our body. That over time comes as a function of changing of the orientation of our shoulder. Our shoulder joints face much more forward. While we still maintain the ability to uh, hang, obviously, and to brachiate, our shoulder joints compared to our ape cousins are not – their shoulder joints, the actual, the actual surface of the glenophosa – I'm sorry, that's not the right joint. But the, the, the shoulder joint itself is pointing up. It's more vertically oriented. So they have this large gap of non-impinged tissue going overhead. And so um, what happens is, yes, we can brachiate, yes, we can hang, but one of the interesting consequences is every human being on planet Earth, once their shoulder gets to 90 degrees of flexion going overhead, like reaching up, is impinged. That is to say we are crushing the supraspinatus tendon and um, you know, some other smaller tissues underneath your AC joint. Everyone is. And yeah. that is actually like a crowbar now because once you go above that, you can feel your collarbone tilting up in some of the muscles of your ribs pulling your shoulder blade forward to go overhead. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what ends up happening is when people are doing kind of overhead press movements or they're, they're hoisting things overhead, it's a little bit like negative compounding because you're just scrubbing these tendons underneath your AC, uh, underneath the AC joint and it becomes a little bit like negative compounding. Like okay. I suffered it a thousand times and nothing happened and then snap, all of a sudden my mildly frayed tendon that was not really inflamed gives way. Right. Uh, that doesn't mean never go overhead. And in fact, it's, it's kind of the reverse when you're doing a pulling type motion. When you pull mm -hmm. your lat, which is like, because it attaches to the front of your shoulder, like giant slings around your back, pulls your sternum up, which opens some space at the shoulder. It, it decompresses that impingement a little bit. But what happens when people are reaching overhead with high effort is they're often doing this, which is... Mm like a clamp. So, so basically kind of like kind of caving in your chest a little as you're trying to push. But so what's the signal that people are getting that's making them think this is a good thing? It's not that they're getting it. They're, well, they feel their shoulder. They're, so uh, if they're deliberately like my shoulders are weak or I suffered this. So I'm going to go overhead and, or they're, or they'll really, this is a classic kind of overhead press that a lot of nobody are, they're told not to do anymore. Be pressing behind the neck. Right. Because you're most externally rotated and that pec is, is compressed on the shoulder and then you're going up overhead and you're like, man, I, f I really feel my shoulders. <laughs> and the reason you really feel your shoulders is the same reason you really felt the forearm in this joint lock that we were talking about. Because it's a poor mechanical position. Got it. The muscles are as contracted as they can be. They cannot contract any further. And so, we feel that is work, even though it's just bad mechanics. So this is an interesting thing. This is, this is, uh, it's just making me think of what people refer to with a phrase that I hate is the mind muscle connection. Um, right. Because your mind is connected. It, well, that's a whole other story. But anyway, right. but the point being is if it seems to me from what you're saying is if you're having the joints in the right position, the only place you're going to be feeling the effort from doing some sort of exercise is in the, I mean, assuming you're not putting so much tension in the ligaments and tendons, but right. fundamentally is in the muscles themselves, not, the some, not in the joints, but in the actual muscle. If it doesn't feel smooth, right. you're not basically feeling like, wow, my muscles aren't working, not like I'm being compromised right. and something is awry. Right. And the mind muscle connection, the way people talk about that it, from my experience is when you're really paying attention to the muscles, then you're getting that kind of smooth effort, that smooth contraction. If you're not paying attention, then you're more likely to be doing one of these things that's, that right. is impinging on a joint or putting your joint in a bad position where you're feeling something that's effortful, but not the thing that you really want to be feeling. And think about when you've, if you've ever taken, I, first of all, yes. And then think about whenever you've taken somebody who has been like a shod runner and tried to get them down to more minimalist. Initially, it feels awkward to them. And there's an almost an education process of saying, hey, 
this thing that you got away with previously and felt good to you and right. natural to you, right. we need to create new awareness. And there's a lot of very explicit coaching that you have to like, feel this, feel this, pay attention to how this is moving. Well, the simplest one is not, not even that. The simplest yeah. one is just about cadence. Yeah. So people right. get used to running at a certain cadence, you know, their feet moving right. at a certain number of, of steps per minute. Right. That just starts to feel normal. Even if it's not good, it just feels normal. Mm -hmm. And to get people to start running at a slightly faster cadence, which actually uh, solves many problems right off the bat. Right. Because can't do what you do when you're running at a slower cadence. Um, it just feels wrong for a while. And it, quote, feeling wrong is just a neurological phenomenon. It's like it's just breaking out of a neural habit and laying down new neural pathways feels, mm -hmm. quote, wrong or awkward yep. um, until we lay down the new neural pathways and leave the old ones around, uh, away, and then it's the other way around. Right. So, that's the place. It's very, very interesting to, to watch people who, uh, yeah, when you're trying to just do a new thing, yep. your brain doesn't want you to because it's not energy efficient to learn to learn to do a new thing. I spent, this is a, another weird tangent. So I was an all-American gymnast way back when, yep. and I stopped doing gymnastics actively when I was 32. I've spent the last, how many, how old am I now? 57. The last 25 years. I've spent 25 years uh, doing what I refer to as getting the gymnast out of my body. Yeah, and I've pretty much done it now. Maybe it took me 20 years to do it, but it was unbelievably difficult to just get out of having my shoulders rounded and internally rotated and my pecs overdeveloped and, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, um, it, it was totally stunning. That's amazing. It's, I've, got, I've got a four-year-old who we're, but he jumps off of everything. So I'm going, yeah. I, we need to put you in gymnastics. Um, it's it's going to be great, but I can tell you, you know, did you say it was a girl? No, 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 he's a, you know, oh, I've got, th I've got three sons. Like it's a, <laughs> I don't know why but no, I he, but he, my mind, I, it was because, it, because as you started saying that, I was remembering when I first moved to Boulder, I met a woman who had a daughter who was 10 at the time, who was getting into gymnastics. Mm -hmm. And I said, just so you know, if she gets good at this and I can tell she will in eight years, she, her posture is going to look like mine. Yeah. Eight years right. later, she, you know, we, we looked like we were cut out of the same mold. It was hysterical. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's funny. There's a great book called, uh, I think it's called Bodies. It was like 1999, 2000. And it's a, it's a photo pictorial of all these really high end, high end athletes from, you know, probably 25, 30 disciplines. And the amazing thing is we talked about athletics as accelerated evolution yeah. in the sense that, you know, even though Usain Bolt was taller than all the other sprinters, he was just yeah. kind of an elongated body type of a sprinter. Yeah. Which, which makes sense. That's why he's faster than everybody else. Cause he took fewer strides. He was still, you know, he could, he could maintain that. But you know, it, it's amazing because you look across all these people and you put your thumb on their heads and their body types are, are so self-similar. Right. And, and so, yeah, it's, it's amazing how, you know, co coaches are good. What, what's the classic sprinter line? I can make you faster, but I can't make you fast. Like sprint coaches <laughs> oh, that's say, brilliant. I, I never heard that one. Yeah, it's so yeah, totally yeah. true. I can, I can make you faster, but I can't make you fast in, in, in the right. sense that you, you come pre-equipped with a certain amount of talent. Of course, work beats talent when talent doesn't work. Yeah. Well, but, when, I, when yeah. I was at the World Masters Track and Field Championships yeah. in Finland, I asked yeah. all the people who are over 85, I said, so why are you here? How, I mean, how are you here? Yeah. Is it nature or nurture? And every one of them had the same answer. They said, it's all genetics that we got here. It's all training to see who wins. Yeah. That's a great, great way of putting it. I wish they had more track kind of events here because I'm like the prototypical 800 guy, like middle distance oh, yeah. guy, but there's just not enough competition to reinforce the training. Oh, that's such not, a not, I mean, there's competition, but, but there's not like events where you go like and, and have that, well, I want a bit blasted for a week kind of thing. Yeah, there's, and, I mean, you know, there's not a huge sprinting community in Boulder, um, even though there's a, there's a, good, a bunch of really good sprinters on the, the University of Colorado yeah. team, but there's not a sprinting community here. There's only a couple of us. Um, but it's so funny. I, I was in Austin this past weekend, yeah. and I met Nick Simmons, who's a former 800-meter Olympian. and he's Run gum! Run gum! Run gum guy. And Nick is trying to turn character. himself into a 100-meter guy. And I said to him, it was so cool watching you do this, because when you first started doing it, you just looked like an 800 guy who who is just trying to move his legs faster right. and watching him learn to become a sprinter. has been really entertaining. Yeah. I, um, I said to him, I, I want to race him at some point. He often races people for a hundred bucks. Yeah. I think I could beat him. That's, yeah. that's, that's a shout out to you, Nick. Let's do it. <laughs> um, no, I mean, those are great. Those are great videos. And it, but it is funny cause I'm going across and I, I put my thumb over uh, Johnny Gray's you, you, you know who Johnny Gray was? Yeah, he was like, yeah, yeah. American record. I'm like, son of a bitch, you know, like 175 pounds, six foot, six foot three, you know, and, and well, you're just like, well, man. well, this is, but this is also my argument. When people, when people say things like, you know, they look at, they look at uh, Olympic level marathoners and they look at the shoes they're wearing and then they yeah. go buy those shoes. Yeah. 
I go, hey, look, I don't know why you think anything that guy or that woman is doing is relevant for you. You're not a 105 pound Kenyan running at 13 miles an hour for two hours. Right, right. And, and even more than that, what was that 105 pound Kenyan doing when they were first getting started, regardless mm -hmm. of their body type? That's mm -hmm. a classic. Isn't this book range recently where the, the author was talking about how people want to know what the coach is doing now, but that's very different than what the coach would have done with someone Way at the beginning. Way. Right. Yeah. And so that, that's, my, that's my actual point about this. We'll see the Erwin Lacours of the world. Um, I mean, he's the most prominent. I, I, I haven't, you know, when, when you're growing a business, you keep the blinders on trying to make sure the lights yeah. stay on. And, but the, the people who were sort of like most prominent and, and that's, that's, you're seeing the result of a long period of time right. working on things. I mean, and, and I'm, I'm, he was a triathlete before that. Like he had a long athletic history right. that laid a certain amount of foundation. And so it's my job or our job to kind of like, how can we shorten that so people can get the fun? Okay, we're going to get to that in one second, but, you, but I just want to tell this story because you reminded me of it. When I started gymnastics, the, on day one, this is in seventh grade in junior high school, the coach hands each of us, there's, I don't know, maybe eight or nine of us, each yeah. of us a, a sheet of graph paper, 10 to, the, 10 to the inch graph paper. He says, each one of those squares is 10 push-ups. Whoever fills in the entire page front and back first wins a Coke. <laughs> and we were just competitive as crap. And, you know, within a very short period of time, we were doing 1,000, 1,500 pushups a day in spurts of like, you know, 100, 150. Right. And, um, and this, because the most important movements you can do in gymnastics, pushing and then just like lifting your arm straight in front of you. Right. Uh, so, you know, he knew and it's like, here you go. And there was a couple ab things that he did the same thing. First one to do this wins a Coke. And it was <laughs> insane. But I mean, it really laid down his, he knew that as whatever, however old we were, 13 year old kids, something like that, we needed to get strong. That yep. was going to be the most important thing for the rest of our career. Yep. And that's what we did. Yep. You know, yep. messed us up. Myriad that's cool. ways, but that's beside <laughs> the point. So somebody comes in. So the found, so building a foundation for natural movement. This is where we all started, and where we you know jumped around to. So talk to me about what you do with human beings and what human beings listen to this can do to build that up. And and let me actually before we jump into that, this the, the, I said I was going to talk about Irene Davis. The conversation Irene and I have, she says, you know, people really need to walk before they run, like literally, like spend a bunch of time walking barefoot, walking in a truly minimalist shoe, like hours, then, um, you know, build up for, for running. I say, that's cool. That's one way. The other way is run for a super short distance, 20 seconds, 30 seconds. See how you feel. If it hurts, do something different until you're having fun. If it feels like just muscular pain, just rest. You know, you, you need to do less, not necessarily get stronger. It's usually because you're trying to do too much with certain muscles. Um, if it feels like you really hurt something, then you need to pay attention to your form. And most likely, you need to stop overstriding, stop pulling your foot across the ground, stop pushing your foot off the ground, um, pick up your cadence a little bit, et cetera. And so, you know, I, I, and I ultimately think that we're getting similar results because we're not hearing of people having a whole bunch of injuries, you know, having a bunch of problems. We all want to make sure that people who are getting into natural running uh, are as free from things like stress fractures as humanly possible. Because the moment one person out of a million gets one, everyone goes, yeah, see, that's bullshit, um, yeah. which is, of course, nonsense. Because the thing, the point that I always make is you have to look at the cohort of normal runners in regular shoes and see what the injury rate is there and then compare it to people who have acclimated to natural movement. And what we, there, we don't have that data, but I know you would agree anecdotally, we're pretty confident that the people who've acclimated are not getting the same kind of injuries or severity of injuries. Or well, and, and those 105 pound Kenyans you're talking about, I mean, Lieberman, Daniel Lieberman pointed this out that, that, and actually uh, in the book, uh, Running with Running with the Kenyans, the author was talking about how all the young Kenyan kids in the, 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 in these early track meets, they're all running barefoot. Oh yeah. And then eventually they're, because the cadence is the good cadence, the barefoot strike cadence is so right. ingrained, then you can go to a normal shoe and they're still landing with their foot, you know, underneath their center normal, of gravity. Normal-ish. Normal because if you, normal -ish. Had, if you had enough heel, if you add enough padding to the heel, right. the normal, quote, barefoot um, gait, the heel just literally gets in the way. You just right. bump into it and then you're right. kind of screwed. A, a guy that I met um, this past weekend, he's a double amputee from the time he was four. He had meningitis and they had to remove both his legs from the knees down. He's got a, I think knees down. I can't remember if he's got knees or not. Anyway, he's got a son who's four years old and at, ran a one mile trail race recently and came in third to some 10 year olds and, <laughs> and he's never worn shoes. 
yeah. uh, or not, not normal shoes. Yeah. And he showed me a picture of this kid at the end of a race. And first of all, his form is gorgeous. Right. And secondly, he is just beaming. He's so happy. And this is my joke about barefoot runners. You can spot them from a mile away because they're looking like they're having a good time. Right. Oh yeah. Even with, it's amazing because you're right. I mean, it, even in the most minimal shoe, it's, it's still different than barefoot running and, yeah. and you, and still returning that barefoot running, even when you've gotten good at it. I played, I played a game with my kids. It's like just running high fives in the, in front of our house. It was like a long run up, but they have to do it barefoot. Like we have to run and do it barefoot. So it's amazing. I mean, they, they're, they're running everywhere barefoot, but I think you both, uh, both you and Irene are, are triangulating on, I'm going to use kind of distance running vernacular, even though I, 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 you know, I've run a couple 20, I've run a 25 K trail race, but I don't fancy myself a distance runner. If you think about 80% of your time running, which is what she or walking, excuse me, barefoot to build up small percentage of time, maybe, maybe 15, uh, ish percent of your time with those spurty kind of stuff, maybe on an infield of a track, something like that, those softer natural surfaces. And then my, my point that I'd say is, oh, it doesn't even need to be softer. I'm saying softer relative, you know, because if, depending on the track, because I've got a track of stone. Oh, you don't know, you don't want to, you don't want to have someone go run barefoot on a track because those Mondo surfaces are like glass. Right, uh, right, like, right, right. Yeah, some, mean, of, some, some of them are better. Like, like, you know, broken glass. Like broken glass. I do it, yeah. I do it, but I don't recommend it. Right. And then I'm suggesting that when we're coming full circle to the biomechanics of this whole thing, at the ankle and the calf, there's only so many articulations that are like the big foundational articulations. Plantar flexion, dorsiflexion, right? Well, lifting your lifting your up ankle, and and uh, you have inversion and eversion, right? right? Which is the which is the wiggle. And so, actually, when when people are coming into this, it's plantar flexion is not just the calf, the gastroc. It is the plantar. It is the muscles of the arch of the foot also contributing right. and building up and getting strengthened. And when we think about um, I have a machine to do shin raises in here, but I have found that if you could take somebody, and I'll have to find a video for you, so to help demonstrate this to people. You, you put people's heels on a block, and you put them kind of leaning against a wall with their toe, as if they were in really high heels. So wait, hold on. So wait, which way are they facing the they're, wall? They're, they're, they're backs on the wall. Backs to the wall. So backs on the wall, so their body's kind of like this. And their, okay. their, their foot is down like this. Wait, wait, I'm, I'm going to paint this for people who, who aren't able yeah. to watch. So yeah. your back's to the wall. You're how far away from the wall? I mean, maybe uh, as I'm, I'm walking away here, if you took about, if you put your whole foot to the wall and then stepped forward, maybe half of the length of your foot and put okay. a block under your heels. Okay. okay. And then you lean back on the wall. So now right. you've, you've got a little bit of a moment arm there. And then when you, you're going to use your heel as the fulcrum. And if you lift your foot to use the shin musculature, Right. And, the, and the anterior musculature of your ankle, you slide up the wall slightly. You have a little bit of resistance in your shirt. Wait, Sliding hold on. Up. the wall here. Wait, I'm going to do this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You got to have to find some, put, put something under your, you can even do it, but you can do it barefoot. But if you had something on under your heel, you oh. give more range of motion. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hold on, hold on. Uh, here. I literally do it with a two by four. <laughs> take a shoe and step on the shoe. There. So you got to have about a half of your foot length, a half oh, yeah. to one foot length, and yeah, then yeah, lift yeah. hard and hold it at the top. You can feel your shin going. Yeah. 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 It's subtle. It's subtle. But, but if we talk about, you know, stress fractures and plantar fasciitis, or uh, even if we're, you know, some people during that transition period, if maybe they've been prone to shin splints, right. The strengthening of the shin muscle is, it, 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 would, it would be helpful to just, how can we speed up this whole process? How can we make those, those articulations stronger? Because those are the foundational articulations that support the dynamic movements that you're going to be encountering in the real world. Got it. Yeah. So that's a really good one. I mean, what do you recommend for people doing that? I mean, people are going to want to know well, how many sets, how many sure, reps, how many sets, how many sets, how many reps. I focus on quality. I would actually try to dis. Now this is challenging because what what I want to try to say is I'm going to give people time and say like you know start by doing this for controlled repetitions for a minute and then adding time rather than saying get eight sloppy repetitions. Well, now, and so let's back up to our whole yeah. thing about yeah. quote mind muscle connection and, yeah. and doing things naturally. So. Um, if you want people to be paying attention to the good feeling, the right yeah. feeling, if you will, mm -hmm. what would you be cueing them to pay attention to so that over sure. time they know when things have broken down and it's time to stop? Okay. Okay. So the muscle, the, the actual, in that dorsiflexion kind of sliding up the wall, the muscle belly is, it becomes basically connective tissue tendon 
up near the tibial plateau, which if you just run, if you if you touch your kneecap and then slide down maybe an inch and a half, it dips a little yep. bit and then it yep. becomes that bone. You feel it pop up. That's the tibial plateau that you've just run your fingers across. You shouldn't feel the effort there. In the middle of your calf, off to the outside of the leg, you'll feel the flesh, the muscle belly, yeah, and the so shin. That. That's where you should be feeling it. Yeah. That is where the work is being done. You will feel a little tension on the front side. And as you get more aware of what's going on, you'll actually feel uh, the muscles on the top of the foot that are lifting the toes. And there is some, because I, I, I have a large cohort of older population, there's some evidence to demonstrate that people's gait improves when you strengthen their shin muscle. Um, it's a little chicken or the egg. And wh why would it improve? Why would they, their stride increase? Because the, the reflex of lifting their foot yep. through the gait yep. cycle, it gets yeah, out of yeah, the yeah. way. So, so do they start dragging their feet because they're weak or do they start shortening their stride because their foot starts to drag? It's, I love that you pointed this out. It's something that I've yeah. noticed is every now and then, especially with our sandals, someone yeah. will say, hey, wait, do I have one handy? Uh, it's too far mm -hmm. away. They'll say, hey, the sandal is floppy. And I hold it up. I go, no, it doesn't. It doesn't flop on its own. It doesn't flex in the wrong way on its own. What's happening is you're dragging your toes because you're, you're, not, you're not getting... And it's not that you're not lifting your toes, I don't say it that way, but you're not positioning yourself where you get the reflex that your toes naturally lift mm -hmm. as they come underneath your body. So you're, you, are, you are, one way of describing it would be dragging your toes, but, but you just described why that's happening in a way that I hadn't thought of before. It's brilliant. Yeah. And it, it was totally accidental. It was one of these things where I had an older woman who was, um, she was going to go on a pretty aggressive hike in either Peru or, or somewhere, in, somewhere in South America. Oh, <laughs> so I was going to bolster her. I was just like, okay, well, what can I do to make sure that you've got some, some armor? And she came back to me after a little while. She's like, I'm walking better all of the time, you know? Interesting. And I said, I start digging into the literature and I kind of put this together and I don't have an answer, but that, that seems to be, there's a lot of literature on kind of asking, okay, is it the, the, the tibial dorsiflexors that are weakening that result in this shortening of the stride? Mm -hmm. Um, or, or, or as, is a shortening of the stride due to propulsion or is a shortening of the stride due to this drag as a result of this reflex not being as strong to get the foot out of the way right. during the middle of the swing phase? It, what's funny, because you would think, and, and I've played with this as I've been walking, you would think that as your foot's about to come off the ground where your toes are pushing into the ground, that the reflex would be, or the natural thing would be that as your foot comes off the ground, your foot points more, your plantar flex more, because it's already mm -hmm. heading in that direction, you're already putting force in that direction. But the reality is that the exact opposite. The moment your foot comes off the ground, it pulls back, it dorsal flexes, mm -hmm. it back towards your knee in a way that, that obviously makes sense. It's why we can walk, but it's one of those things that's, that seemingly counterintuitive when you're mm -hmm. doing it it's like what you watch it happen you can't you should mm -hmm. um but it's like god that seems odd because anywhere else if i was pushing and then got rid of the force i'd keep going in that same direction but in this right. case it's you know doing the exact opposite right well we're we're full of recoil tendons so there's a lot of right. you know the wind up and pitch wind yep. up and pitch. and that's that at the end of the day that that's the the key component no i'm i'm you know i think that it, this is just a tiny tiny addition with a, you know, and, and the fact that you're deliberately doing this means you're bringing a certain amount of deliberate intensity to it, of course. which as we know, pays it done, done with the right dosing pays much more per unit of time. So yeah. in the grand scheme of things, I'm asking that people go, okay, what are the big articulations to build a foundation so that I can do more of the natural movement that I'd rather be doing? And it's a few minutes. And, mo and actually, this is the problem is that most people, you look at studies of like active 80 year olds who garden and are otherwise active, and then like 80 year old resistance trainers, and what happens is the resistance trainers can actually volitionally recruit all the available strength in their muscle tissue versus the merely active people. I'm like, oh, well, okay. does that mean we all need to become weightlifters? Well, they, they do it in an isometric test that nobody's practiced. So, so from a, there's not, nobody's training to the test, which is nice. nice. But as a result of that, they, um, no, my client just walked in, but she'll, she'll appreciate the end of this discussion that, but as a, as a result of this is that, um, the, being active is, is the whole point. We want that. Uh, but if we could add a little bit of resistance training to get those fast switch fibers in the ankle, which are your immediate stabilizers, your subconscious signal yep. goes to the spine, goes right back to the foot, um, stronger. It's just a little dose. Yeah. You're going to have a lot more fun. 
Oh no, it's it's true, and and yeah, we should have opened with that uh, against the wall exercise. Um, it, it, it's interesting because this is something that uh, Sarah Ridge at BYU, who I talked to, her research was that just walking in a minimal shoe gives you the same strengthening benefits as just doing as a dedicated foot strengthening program. They didn't think to have a cohort doing strengthening plus just walking. Right. Um, but so um, we don't have a whole lot of time left. But I just want to check. So anything else that you want to share with people about something about building a foundation? Um, whether, whether it has to do with walking, running, I mean, I like it, of course, because that's a foot thing, but anything else that would be that something that people do that you see on a regular basis where if they would make this little tweak would, you know, be way, way, way helpful. Yeah. So, I mean, I mean, often planking or plank like motions, crawling type motions get, get thrown around in the natural movement world. And if I can encourage anybody to do anything in a, in a plank type motion is plank is not, should not be a passive exercise, which you, what people should be doing when they're down in that position is attempting to pull their shoulders down towards their hips as far as possible and simultaneously tilt their pubic bone up towards their sternum. Mm -hmm. Imagine if you imagine that kind of crunch on the ground shape and flipped it around, right. gravity is trying to pull your belly button to the floor. So what often happens is people are hyper extending their spine and complaining about how much they feel their back. And then this translates to crawling, right? Because what doesn't happens is if nobody's been on the ground in a really long time, right. then they're, they've got their back sagged and they're, they've totally spilled their pelvis in the anterior tilt and they're complaining about their back. Well, the, the fix to that is actually not to just try to suck in your belly button, but to actually mildly flex your spine against gravity to, by creating tension in your stomach. It's um, it's something that uh, there are a number of people who've talked about this, and it, it's really true how most people think of a plank. I don't know how to describe it, but that the real value of doing it is basically creating tension across through your entire body. Right. And I mean, elbows down to your toes yeah. and, and squeeze your glutes, which like people go, but that's on the other side. It's like, yeah, I know right. that's what you need to do to engage to the abs as well. It's uh, it's something I, I, I've talked about before. Glenn Mills, who's Usain Bolt's coach said that what got him to be a successful hundred meter runner was they spent a year just getting his core working because he was just super loosey goosey. And they had, and, and of course that works your glutes, that works your abs. And he's not, um, he hates the weight room, just hates the yeah. weight room. You say, uh, or Glenn? Uh, Usain. Okay. Glenn loves the weight room. Usain. Because I mean, so you see videos of, of Usain in the weight room. Probably because oh. Glenn put him in there. Oh, no. He's, he's crushing it. He just doesn't yeah. like doing it. Sure. So, um, he used to talk about that, which is very entertaining. And there's a whole argument about you know, whether, whether sprinters need the weight room. And, well, that's a whole other thing. Anyway, um, anything else you want to leave people with um, on the movement side? You think? No, I think, I think we, we've covered it all. Exhausted. Or at least what we tend to. to. Talk about it again. That sounds perfect. So, <laughs> um, so dude, Skylar, thank you so much. If people want to get in touch with you in any way, what would you recommend? How would they sure. do it? Sure. Uh, I'm, I'm not really on social, so it's a hard time finding me there, or at least it's going to take a while for me to come back around to it. Uh, Skyler, that's S-K-Y-L-E-R at smartstrengthaustin.com. Feel free to shoot me an email smartstrengthaustin.com. One, one giant word, no hyphen. Yes, of course. I, I, it's amazing to me that people still say things like all one word or all lowercase. or It's like, <laughs> come, come on, we know this by now. <laughs> so, uh, but, all right, uh, man. I think it's my mom who, you know, like still says that it's all one word. I know mom. All right. Well, dude, again, once again, total treat. Um, I will see you at the next paleo FX. I'll be out there. You're going to be coming awesome. walking by. I, I, I might be walking by. I might be walking walk by. by. I've got shoes for you. Well, well, I'll, I'll definitely, if I'm there, I'm, 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 of course I'm going to see you. All right. Okay. You know where to find. <laughs> uh, so for everybody else, um, where you can find me is at www.jointhemovementmovement.com. That's all one word. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and because, you know, we are creating a movement movement, getting people to share the fun and benefits of natural movement so we can make this the obvious, better, healthy choice the way natural food currently is. You are the movement of this movement. So share and like and, uh, and review and give a thumbs up and, you know, ring the bell so you hear about these if you're watching this on YouTube. As I uh, always say, if you want to be part of the tribe, please subscribe. If you have any questions, feel free to drop me an email at move at join the movement movement.com. If there's anyone you know who should be uh, someone that we chat with on this, um, you can send that as well. And as always, go out, have fun and live life feet first. <laughs>